Hey everybody, this is Pastor Sullivan at Holy Cross Lutheran Church in Kerrville, Texas, answering your questions here on ATP Ask the Pastor. Today, we have a question that is remarkably important because it is the world in which we live now. Somebody writes, Dear Pastor, how are Christians to think of the social justice issues? How are we to interact with them? I understand that issues such as helping the homeless and the poor are good causes, but many of the other issues seem secular and divisive. All right, so first thing we got to keep in mind right out of the chute is that the concept of contemporary social justice, as it's preached today by politicians, uh, e even in some churches, is that it is not the same as biblical justice or even classical justice. Justice is social by its very nature because it's the virtue of treating others fairly and with impartiality. Justice uh, ultimately is one of God's attributes. Isaiah 30, 18 says the Lord is a God of justice, which means that in God there is no impartiality. He applies justice equally to everyone. He is not a respecter of persons, and he commands his people uh, to behave in that way as well. He commands us uh, to see that the weak are treated fairly and to speak up for, the just, uh, for their just treatment in the face of of the wicked who would oppress them. You know, in the Old Testament, examples of injustice are things like uh, bribery, uh, using inaccurate scales when selling things to people, so, you know, putting your thumb on the scale, um, showing, partiality, showing partiality to the rich because they're rich, or on the other hand, showing partiality to the poor just because they're poor, uh, Exodus 23, verse 3. All of those behaviors are unjust because they are partial and unfair. Now, for individuals, then, justice is following the second table of the law, commandments 4 through 10. For governments, justice is encouraging, rewarding good behavior, uh, and executing judgment on lawbreakers. Now, ultimately, when it comes down to it, justice is one of those words that doesn't need an adjective, because there aren't different kinds of justice. There's just justice. Now, social justice, as it's understood today, then, is really the practical application of critical race theory. Critical race theory is a worldview that sees the world through the lens of power with the goal of enacting revolutionary change. Uh, so there is a group of people who possess power illegitimately. Uh, they are the oppressors, and everyone is either an oppressor or belongs to the oppressed group. Uh, and people can occupy overlapping uh, oppressed groups. And so that the more marginalized oppressed groups a person occupies, the more oppression they experience. That's the theory of intersectionality. Now, in this worldview, uh, it's important to note that people are no longer individuals. They're members of collective groups then. Uh, the oppressors then in this system, they have established systems and institutions which preserve their power. CRT posits that it is the white Christian male that has power and that they have built systems and institutions that are racist by nature in order to perpetuate their power. The UCLA School of Public Affairs website puts it this way. I think this is a good, succinct way of putting it. CRT recognizes that racism is ingrained in the fabric and system of the American society. The individual racist need not exist to note that institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture. This is the analytical lens that CRT uses in examining existing power structures. CRT identifies uh, that these power structures are based on white privilege and white supremacy, which perpetuates the marginalization of people of color. CRT also rejects their traditions of liberalism and meritocracy. Legal discourse says that the law is neutral and colorblind. However, CRT challenges this legal truth by examining liberalism and meritocracy as a vehicle for self-interest, power, and privilege. End of quote. So there's a lot in there. But critical race theory, it says, is the lens that shows racism and, and the mechanisms of perpetuating racism in nearly every aspect of American culture. And then it proposes revolutionary change. And, and it's important that we know that the change is revolutionary. 
uh, it's not interested in reform because uh, the very institutions are themselves racist. Now, th this is also then a new definition of racism. Racism uh, is the belief that one race is superior to other races, and then discrimination and prejudice based on that belief. But critical social justice tries to redefine racism as a system uh, into which people are socialized, a system that creates and maintains racial discrimination, uh, inequality, and injustice. And so that's why uh, in that paragraph it says the individual racist need not exist to know that institutional racism is pervasive in the dominant culture then. So racism is no longer a sin in the heart. Racism is a sin outside of ourselves into which we are socialized. Uh, it's important to note then that inequality and any ju uh, um, um, and injustice are, again, from the social justice contemporary point of view, not equal treatment, but equal outcome. By this definition then, when you put all this together, any perceived or real disparity between racial groups then proves inequality and injustice. Kendi X. Abram, uh, author of How to Be an Anti-Racist, writes, racial inequality is when two or more racial groups are not standing on approximately equal footing. Now, this assumes then that there's only one variable at work here, and that is the variable of race. In reality, though, unequal footing is the result of a, an entire constellation of variables, some of which people have no control over, some of which they have some control over. From the CRT worldview, though, every disparity is the result of racist power structures and you know, proves the old saying, when the only tool you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. CRT's answer then, and social justice's answer to all these perceived and real inequalities then, are anti-racism. Abrams defines an anti-racist as a person who is expressing the idea that racial groups are equals and none needs developing and is supporting policy that reduces racial inequality. Now, he, he writes that policies, uh, that's a term that he uses as a synonym for institutions, structures, systems, all that. Uh, he writes that policies are to create equity even if they use discrimination to achieve it. Quote, if discrimination is creating equity, then it is anti-racist. If discrimination is creating inequity, then it is racist. The only remedy to racist, racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. This discrimination that he preaches, by the way, is the opposite of true justice. Nor is there any race-neutral policy for Abrams, um, any colorblindness. He says that's just another shade of uh, racism uh, being used to maintain white supremacy. And of course, then, uh, there's no room for any disagreement with these ideas because that also then demonstrates that one is racist and that you're trying to uphold the current power structures. Um, so it's a big Kafka trap. Uh, by denying you are racist, uh, that just demonstrates that you are. Now, several authors over the last several years uh, have noted and argued that anti-racism is religious in nature, uh, that it's even a cult. Uh, it's got original sin in racism. Uh, the law that one must live by is anti-racism. Its gospel is rac racial uh, reconciliation. Oppressed minorities are its priesthood, by which uh, it reveals the singular black voice to white people. Remember, because there are no individuals, just groups. Being woke is the new birth. It even has its own canon with its own theologians. The one thing it doesn't have is salvation. Uh, Vody Bauckham points out in his book Fault Lines, white people are not called to look to God for forgiveness. They're not told that Christ's blood is sufficient. No, they are told that they must do the unending work of anti-racism. And this work must be done regardless of their own actions, since the issue at hand is a matter of communal generational guilt based on ethnicity. So ultimately, critical race theory teaches people to find their identity and their skin color uh, based on the amount of melanin they have and to think of themselves then based upon that observation as either oppressors in need of continual penance 
or as the oppressed in need of continual political and cultural revolution. Now, contrary to this is the actual gospel, uh, the Christian gospel, that offers an identity that isn't based on the color of one's skin, your economic class, or any other social identity. The gospel offers us the identity as sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. The gospel alone is what truly unites. Uh, the gospel alone is what truly tears down the dividing wall between races and ethnicities. Uh, it's as St. Paul says in Galatians 3, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Faith in Christ is what unites believers as God's people. And it's their identity. So the Christians don't answer the question of who am I with, well, I'm white, I'm black, I'm brown, but as I'm Christian. And then as Christians, uh, Christians do justice, not working for equal outcomes for all, but by treating others fairly, by treating others without partiality and speaking up for the just treatment of anyone in the face of the wicked who would oppress them. Where there is racism in the heart, or on the tongue, or in the behavior, then it's also called sin, and it's condemned for what it is, so that there can be repentance, forgiveness, and amendment of life. And in those cases in which there is structural racism, Christians can speak out, and they should speak out against that. But Christians don't believe that racism is chiefly structural or systemic. It is, first and foremost, it is chiefly a sin of the heart. And the only way to deal with things of the heart is repentance, not revolution, amendment of one's life, not the abolition of the social order. So that's how we address critical race theory, social justice movement going on uh, in our society. Now, one thing I would highly recommend, uh, Vody Bauckham Jr.'s book, Fault Lines, the Social Justice Movement and Evangelicalism's Looming Catastrophe, uh, published in 2021. Uh, it, is a great, uh, it is a great resource, I think, that all Christians need to read as, well, this is the world now in which we live. So, hope this helps. We will see you next time for another episode of ATP Ask the Pastor.